Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this group that's on this Zoom call, and thank you for the opening of your word. Thanks for Pastor Randy for sharing the message with us. God, open our hearts and our minds to hear from you for what you have for us today. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you. Sorry. Hey, well, next time, next time I'll need to remember to make sure that uh, we get somebody without young children to uh, pray for us, right? <laughs> Hey, we've all been there, man. This is all good. No worries at all. That's what makes it interesting and a lot more fun than just the clinical situation. All right. So off we begin. Let me see here. I know we've probably got a couple more people that will be joining us and uh, getting on with us in just a moment. So off we go. We are here in Daniel, the book of Daniel, the God of might and insight is the way that I am terming this and uh, the title of this book study. And uh, we're going to do a little bit of review. You guys get ready to answer a few of these review questions. Hopefully you remember a few of these things. We are talking last week about how the books of the Bible are not in chronological order and how important it is to know that. Uh, and why it's important is because sometimes as you're reading through the scriptures, it begins to feel like, oh, well, Genesis is the first book and Revelation is the last book. And so that means it's all in chronological order. That's not really true. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that they are much more uh, in the order of um, the subject and the style. Uh, and so as you begin to look through, you really do actually see these breakdowns that you see here on your screen, where you've got the law and then the history, then the writings, which is like poetic books and, uh, you know, lyrical type books and things like that. And so you can see that that is much more, uh, makes much, much more sense. And then you see the prophets, including the major and the minor prophets, including all of the 12, all the ayahs at the end, you know, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, you know, all of them at the end of the book, uh, the books of the Old Testament. And then you have the major prophets. Now, the major prophets, kind of interesting, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel are big books with a number of different chapters. And Daniel is actually only about 12 chapters. And so it might feel like that's not necessarily a major prophet, but he was very, very important. And he was seen as a um, maybe just a, a high quality prophet. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but he was just seen and held in high regard for how long he was a prophet in the circumstances that he was a prophet under. So here is where you guys come in. Hopefully you guys will remember this. I tried to term it just like it was last week. Daniel is part blank found in chapters one through six and part blank found in chapters seven through 12. Does anybody remember what these two different parts of Daniel are? History. Daniel is part history and that's and very good. Prophecy. And prophecy. Very good. All right. Let me give you a, there we go. Security got a sticker. Good job. Uh, chapters one through six uh, are the history. Chapters seven through 12 are the prophecy. And uh, then it says that Daniel shares life events that span two world empires, the blank empire and the blank blank empire. And that's not me cursing. Just be clear about that, especially if you're looking at this later. Um, what is the first empire that we, the, the, the stage comes up and Daniel has been taken to what city and what empire? The Babylonian. Babylonian. Very good. You guys are on point. All right, let's all clap for Teresa. Teresa, yay. Thank you for coming. Teresa, Donahue, we're giving you a hard time. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> we're giving you a hard time. <laughs> all right. And then it says, and the blank dash blank. Do you guys remember that one? That one's kind of a little bit more difficult. Do you remember that uh, second world empire that Daniel's uh, story spans? Do you remember? Persian. Is okay. it Persian? Persian. Persian. Persian Empire. Very good. No, you guys are on point tonight. I appreciate it. Good job. The Medio Persian Empire. And so, um, if you don't know, um, I Babylon is modern day Iraq, and Persian is modern day Iran. And there has been a lot of conflict between Iraq and Iran all throughout the years. That's not 
anything new. Um, and you'll see at the end of the book that the Babylonian Empire is actually conquered by the Medio Persian Empire. And we're going to talk about that in, in a little later date in the next few weeks. Good stuff coming up. All right. Do you guys remember this? We talked a little bit about how one of the things that we know that people want to do whenever they want us to begin to compromise ourselves and be somebody different than we want to be, they try to get us to forget who we are. And we talked a lot about this. And this actually has. Uh, relevance as you're looking at any other scripture. If you remember, I, I tried to emphasize the ending there of Daniel is probably how it was actually pronounced, or Hananiah. Ah is, you know, kind of with yeah, the Yah, which means the Lord, um, short for Yahweh. And El was more like the, um, was God. And that was the Hebrew word for God. And Yahweh was the proper name for um, the Lord himself. And so as you look at these different names, they were given names by their families that honored God. But then when they were captured, they were given brand new names that honored a whole set of pagan gods that left and turned their back on the God of um, the God of Israel. And so if you remember that, you kind of uh, can get a sense of, seeing some of that in all the different names, including Israel, right? So there you are. Okay, now we talked about the timeline for ancient cultures, including Egyptian, the Israeli, uh, Israeli kingdom that was united and then eventually divided. And you remember we talked about how there was one that was divided into a north and a southern kingdom. Um, and we talked a little bit about that. Then we talked about the Assyrian and Babylonian empire. And then as you see, Right here, you see Daniel's name as he was captured by the Babylonians, but as he serves all the way into the Medio Persian Empire. He was there for a very long time because he was taken as a very, very young man. And so last week's homework assignment was to read Daniel chapter 1, verse 8 through 21. And I ask you to come with some sort of insight. So, who has some insight that they would like to share? It's, 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 I've always noticed that the first person sounds so incredibly wise. So jump in there, be the first person, sound incredibly wise, and beat all these other suckers to the punch, right? So get in there. What did you see from Daniel chapter one that kind of spoke to you? Oh, Eric's you're wisdom, jumping up. Wisdom and understanding <laughs> because of what they ate. What did you say? You know what? You did good, Frank. That's called the gunslinger. You just got your gun out of the holster and fired quicker than, than him. Hey, that's how it is. Tell me again, though. We want to hear that from you, Frank. What did you say? Uh, received wisdom and understanding because of the, the food that they ate and didn't drink the wine. Yeah. So they... Uh, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Stayed away from eating meat and wine. Oh, all right, guys. I didn't realize that we had a closet vegan right here among us. I'm sorry. Uh, we need to be praying for this young man. <laughs> no, that's good. And do and you remember the great line, the great line? Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. He, he did purposed in himself that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. And that's good. That's good, Frank. I appreciate it. Good stuff. What else? Uh, did you have one that you were going to jump in there and share, Eric? Yeah, I was. Um, I you're, <laughs> uh, I was going to say you're breaking up a little bit, Randy. I don't know if it was me or you, so I don't know if I'm about to break up or not. But um, I just went in verse 17, and for these four use, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom thought that was pretty incredible god gave them so much knowledge and intelligence like everything they go through it's all from god so that, yeah. I thought just, that was interesting yeah that's good and if you noticed uh that goes right along with what peter read from the proverbs this past sunday where it said you know the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom and uh i thought that was really good and uh and this is just one more example that really wisdom and even knowledge sometimes doesn't just come from learning in books and a degree hanging on the wall. You can be a person who doesn't have a degree on the wall, but you can be wise. You can be full of knowledge about things that matter that have nothing to do with book learning, but have everything to do with how to live a right kind of life in, in a good direction on your life. So that's great. Uh, great observation, guys. 
Uh, do any of the females want to get these guys to shut up and put them in their proper place? Can I get an amen from the ladies? Our, oh, <laughs> Tori's back there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, ladies, what did y'all have? Give me an observation from one of the prettier sides of this conversation. Yeah, I just had an observation that their faith, faithfulness in God, you know, to not defile themselves and, you know, they're acting faithful and everything. And he returned with the great blessing of, you know, all their knowledge and understanding and being able to interpret the dreams and stuff. Yeah, I, I think that's a great observation. And I would say, um, uh, to just kind of piggyback and go even just a, a tiny bit further, I would say that you're on to something there that I think anytime we are faithful, God will give us more influence and increase you know what i'm saying like he will begin to to bless and to multiply the responsibility and the impact of what we're doing and i think that's really good uh observation there terry that you know they were faithful and god blessed and that's the way it goes so that's good stuff very good very good all right i won't cut anybody off but um i won't linger anybody have one more that we need to hear before we go one one notch further and get started anyone I just thought it was interesting how that last verse shows you how close Daniel is to the end of the exile. Because it mentions that he remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. And wasn't it King Cyrus who allowed the Jews to go back to their homeland? Yes, actually, very much so. Um, at, the, uh, at the beginning of, I believe it's the book of Ezra, it says the word of the Lord came from Cyrus that we could go back and repopulate. Uh, in Jerusalem. And so, yes, Daniel is there for a long time. He is there from Babylon all the way through the Babylonian uh, part of the empire and into the years of King Cyrus. So that's really good. And that's a great observation for sure. He was there a long time, but he was faithful to God in a difficult place for a very long time. So that's definitely a great observation. Good stuff. Daniel. All right. Um, Pastor, I have one observation too. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, from even the king's point, I uh, what I observed was like uh, even God gave uh, King Nebuchadnezzar an opportunity to have a godly advice and a counsel in his own kingdom. Apart from all other uh, people around him, he was so impressed uh, with these guys. And I think uh, even God has a thing for him also. Uh, he gave him a chance to see who true God is. Yeah, I think that's a great observation as well, that that Nebuchadnezzar had a godly counsel from God's own man right there at his right hand. Yeah, that's great. And uh, God was at work even in a, uh, in a in a heathen king, if you'll allow me to put it in that way. A God who, I mean, a guy who was not interested in God, and yet God put an advisor right there next to him. So that's great. Great observations. You guys are good. Um, I really appreciate it. And I like this part the best because honestly, uh, I already know what I'm thinking. I love hearing what you guys are thinking. And I already know what God's spoken in my heart. Sometimes I end right there. And so I always love hearing a different perspective and hearing what God is speaking to your heart. So that's great. I appreciate that very much. All right. So let me just do one more bit of review. And the reason I want to share this one more time is the timeline of Israel and its prophets. And I want to just make sure that you guys all realize that there are at times difficult to follow because of the Northern kingdom and the Southern kingdom. And I wanted to be clear on the fact that one is called Israel and one is called Judah. And so as you read through the old Testament, it might get a little confusing if you don't recognize that they are literally two different kingdoms with two different capitals, but God is at work in the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, the Israel, uh, the kingdom that was known as Israel, the northern kingdom, fell in 722 BC. And you can see that Isaiah was one of those prophets that was predicting that. But then Judah, the southern kingdom, falls in 586. And you see that Daniel goes at about 605 to um, Nebuchadnezzar and the king of Babylon and all of that. And you can see here a little further. Let me move this over just a touch. You can see that Ezra and Nehemiah and Malachi here are the ones that eventually end up um, going all the way back uh, to Israel and starting that back up. So very good stuff and uh, great information from you guys. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so off we go into Daniel chapter 2. 
And this is Daniel interpreting the dreams of the king. It says, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So the king summoned the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to tell him what he had dreamed. And when they came in and stood before the king, he said to them, and look and listen to what he says to him. I've had a dream that troubles me and I want to know what it means. Then the astrologers answered the king, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dreams and we will interpret it. The king replied to the astrologers, this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. I guess if you're the king, you can do whatever you want. But this does not exactly seem like the most level-headed request nor attitude that we've ever heard, right? Uh, he's basically saying, not only do you have to tell me what the dream means, you have to tell me what the dream was. And he, I'm not telling it to you, you're telling it to me, which seems a little backwards, but that's how he was. So he says, but if you do tell me the dream and explain it, you will receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. So tell me the dream and interpret it for me. And once more, they replied, oh, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will interpret it. Then the king answered, I am certain that you are trying to gain time because you realize that this is what I have firmly decided. If you do not tell me the dream, there is only one penalty for you. You have conspired to tell me misleading and wicked things, hoping that the situation will change. So tell me the dream and I will know that you can interpret it for me. The astrologers answered the king, there's no one on earth who can do what the king is asking. No king, no matter how great or mighty, has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or astrologer. What the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live among humans. This made the king so angry and furious that he ordered the execution of all of the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was put into issue and put the, to put the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends to put them to death. So what jumps out? <laughs> what jumps out to you guys in this crazy passage of Scripture? I didn't bring my coffee cup, so... I'm pretending to have my coffee cup here and drink my coffee cup. This is your time to shine. What is jumping out to you in this passage of scripture? Well, if they, if he can't tell them the dream ahead of time, that they have to interpret it and tell it back to him, then that means they can't make up phony stuff. Right, right. Have you guys ever, you know, seen like the horoscopes that could apply to roughly about 85% of people in the world, you know, it's like, hey, I have a horoscope for you. You're going to have a good day, some good and some bad. The day will be somewhat warm in the summer and yet cooler in the winter. You know, it's like, can you be a little more vague if possible? No, not really. Um, and I think the thing that's going on here is he wants to know are you telling me just like sunshine and rainbows and stuff that I want to hear and making it so vague? Or are you able to give me some specifics? That's some really interesting stuff. All right. What else is jumping out to you guys? Anything else? Daniel and his friends were automatically assumed to be part of the group of the wise men, even though it was known that they were different from them and that they weren't necessarily magicians or astrologers. Yeah. Yeah, they were included. They were going to get the brunt of the problem no matter what. This is a pretty, pretty bad situation. And this is very interesting. And I would say this, something that would jump out at you if you're reading in the original, uh, original language, you would not recognize this. And probably none of y'all necessarily paid too close attention to this. But Daniel chapter 2, verse 4 says, Then the astrologers answer the king, and then actually the Hebrew text says in Aramaic, indicating that the text from here through the end of chapter seven is in Aramaic. So let me ask you guys this question. What is the Old Testament written in originally? Do you remember? Hebrew. Hebrew, that's right, that's right. Except for this section here in Daniel for a few chapters, it all is written in Aramaic. What language was the New Testament originally written in? Do you remember? Greek. 
Greek. Very good. So here's a little bonus question for you. What was the language that Jesus and his disciples sure. most likely spoke when Aramaic. they were speaking? Aramaic. Aramaic. Yes, correct. And so just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea here, more than likely Jesus spoke Aramaic. It was written in Greek, but the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. And so this would stand out to you. Now, the reason I share this with you is that you can kind of get a sense of these languages and their fluidity, but it's also very important to understand something. Anytime you see a note like this, a footnote that you see here, number C, look and see what it is. Because a lot of the time it will help you to understand the passage. You guys remember those names that I was telling you about a little earlier as we reviewed? All of those were in a footnote in the Bible in different places. And so you see those footnotes. It can kind of help you to understand and grasp um, the, the story and grasp the meaning of it just a little bit better. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Going back to this story, as they're talking and going back and forth between the king and the astrologers, have you ever had a situation like this? I mean, have you ever been asked to do something nearly impossible and you got to pull it through or else your head is on the chopping block? I mean, have you guys ever had that experience before? I'm just curious. Um, I was thinking that probably there have been some crazy situations in some of your circumstances uh, where someone really asked you something that was almost unrealistic to bring through, but somehow they expected it of you. Have any of y'all ever had that experience before? I'm not talking about in your marriage. Don't be laughing about that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, probably when I was working, th there were lots of expectations that were just about, you know, un very unrealistic. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's interesting, isn't it, that God can sometimes come through and shine in those situations like you never expect him to do. Let me ask you another question. Have any of you guys ever had a dream? that you knew that you had a big dream that it was interesting and like powerful, but you couldn't remember what it was the minute that you woke up. Let me see your hands. Any of y'all ever had that experience? <laughs> I want to be honest with you. I think this is exactly what happened to this King. I think he had a dream that bothered him and he knew it was something important, but he couldn't remember every piece of it. And then when Daniel, if you've read the rest of the verses, Daniel does interpret the thing for him. And I think it's an amazing feeling to have somebody stand there and say, God has told me the dream and here's what it is. And then he begins to recount it. And we're going to read a little bit about that here in just a second. And part of your homework is to look through and read how Daniel handles the king in this situation. But it's really, really powerful and interesting. All right, let's keep moving. So when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out, to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with wisdom and tact. I love that. Daniel spoke to him with what? Wisdom, wisdom and tact. You know, sometimes we as Christians, it would be good for us to be reminded that even when God is on our side, there's no reason that we can't be people who speak with wisdom and tact, you know? Um, I think sometimes we, we act like that's not our responsibility. Well, that's part of the reason that we don't always get blessings sometimes too. But he asks the king's officer, why did the king issue such a harsh decree? He's like, why is everybody's head on the chopping block? And Arioch then explained the matter to Daniel. And let's be very clear. Who was Daniel originally? Who, who, how did he get here to Babylon originally? He was a slave. He was a slave. He was a political prisoner that became somebody in the court. And how did he become somebody in the court? God's favor was on him. And so we see here, this is interesting that Daniel speaks to this man and says, hey, what's going on? Can you explain this to me? And Janet made a great point last week that it took a lot of guts for him to speak up and take himself out of the ranks of the whole herd and separate himself and put himself on the line. But he did it and then God blessed it. Now, in this situation, too, instead of running for his life, Daniel goes to the officer and says, hey, can I ask you a question? 
what in the world is really behind this decree and this edict? It's crazy, isn't it? I mean, it's way harsh. I mean, people's houses are going to get destroyed. All of us are going to get killed. What's that all about? And so Ariok then explained the matter to Daniel. He tells him everything that's going on. In verse 16, at this, Daniel went in and he went straight to the king. Again, that's pretty brave. <laughs> the guy who has already issued a decree for your death goes in and you go into his presence and Daniel says, can you give me just a little bit of time? I'm going to give you the dream. So then Daniel returns to his house and explains the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. And then Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, God of my ancestors. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we are asking of you. And you've made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon. And then he said to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king and I will interpret this dream for him. Arioch took Daniel to the king at once and said, I found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. The king asked Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, which I know is going to be one of y'all's kids names soon, also called Belteshazzar, uh, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? And Daniel replied, no, wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. Your dreams and the vision that passed through your mind as you were lying in bed are these. And then Daniel goes on and he interprets the dream. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about what that dream was right now. But let me just say, coming up in the next uh, week, you are going to have an opportunity to read through how Daniel interprets the dream and what that was. That will be part of your homework assignment from this evening. So Daniel tells him the dream, and it's pretty powerful. Here is what he saw. Can you guys see that okay? This is Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He saw a statue with a head of gold. He saw breast and arms of silver. He saw a belly and thighs of brass. He saw legs of iron. And then he saw feet of iron mixed with clay. And then the Bible does us a true favor because it goes through and it tells Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And this is really interesting. I love how Daniel steps in and says, I'll tell you what your dream was. This is your dream. And then he tells him the dream. And then he goes even further and he interprets the dream. One of the things that he says in there is, this is you, O King Nebuchadnezzar. You're the head of gold. But after you, after your kingdom is gone, there will be another kingdom that is the medial Persian empire that we're going to talk about. And then after that, there will be another kingdom. And that is the Grecian empire. The, do you guys remember who it was that conquered the known world in 333 BC? Alexander the great. That's right. Exactly. Alexander the great and conquered it there in Greece. But then the longer, uh, um, the longer empire was the one from Rome, and it lasts a very, very long time. And then we'll talk about here the feet of part uh, iron and part clay. And so he also mentions, not only did you see this incredible huge statue that, that you know had all of these different makeups and mixtures of different types of material, he says, but you also, while you were watching of that statue, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. Who is the stone that the builders rejected 
who has become the cornerstone. Who is that referring to? Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. And so as you talk about a stone that is cut out, but not by human hands, it says it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. And so Daniel chapter two, verse 34 and 35 B talks about how there was a, a stone that comes down from heaven and shatters this huge, this, it's just the power of Christ that overwhelms even world empires. That's kind of the idea. And so he shares that with them. So let me ask you guys this question. Why do you think God would send a vision like this to a man named Nebuchadnezzar, who is not a king who follows him? He's not a ruler who is a godly man. Why would God send this vision to this man? And you guys know, remember, I told you, when I ask the question and it starts, why do you think there is no wrong answer? So you can speak up because this is your opinion, right? So why do you think that God would send a vision to somebody like Nebuchadnezzar, even though he's not a godly king? So that he could, I guess, get to know Daniel better? I think there is something to what you're saying there because Daniel from this point forward has a different position. He's not just an exile. He becomes a real advisor to the king. And this is something that Kirthi actually mentioned a little in some of the things that she had seen that she puts a, or that he puts a, um, a, a, a an advisor right next to an ungodly king, but a godly man to advise him. And that's kind of interesting as well. Anyone else? Any other reason that you can think that God would send a vision to Nebuchadnezzar? Maybe to show him that no matter how great he thinks he is and his, uh, not nation, but empire is, it's not going to last and that only God really knows what's going to happen and only God will last. Yeah, I think that's a great point too. Um, that's a really good point that there is always an end to every world power. And as much as I hate to admit this, you know, there's also going to be an end to our world power if the Lord doesn't, you know, return and, and take us home before then. The truth is, is that every world power ends. It just does. Uh, every world power ends because there is no power like the power from on high. And so as much as I hate to think about my country not being a world power and not being the empire in control, eventually that will happen. And when it does, God will still remain and it won't change anything at all. I would also say the God of might and insight is telling him right now, hey, what you think you know, you don't know. What you think you have, you don't have. It's a gift, and if I take it away, it will be gone. And I think the God of might and insight, and part of the reason I shared this was it shows us that God is the God who outlasts everything, but he is also the God who knows everything even before it happens. And so he's telling Nebuchadnezzar, even before it happens, what is going to happen, which is a pretty powerful thing if you think about it. All right. Daniel then confidently tells a vision and a dream of that statue that he saw. It is also what Nebuchadnezzar himself saw during that dream. And so it's like, it's a reminder. You're like, that's right. That's exactly what I saw. I don't know if you've ever had that experience where I asked you if you'd ever had a dream that you forgot. How many of you ever had a dream that you forgot, but then something like a name or uh, some sort of something reminds you and it dawns on you. Ah, now I remember that dream that I had. Have any of you guys ever had that experience before? Or am I the only one? All right, so a couple of you guys, you know how that feels like that's that feeling of, oh, I can't believe it. I can't even imagine what that would be like if you like had somebody come to you and say, I'm going to tell you what your dream was. And you're like, well, no, you won't. You know, that's in my own head and I can't even remember it. And then Daniel says, no, 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 you don't understand. There's a God who gives insight and I'm about to tell you what the dream. Here's the dream that you had while you were sleeping last night. He begins to give it to him bit by bit, 
piece by piece, specific by specific. This is no horoscope that reaches, you know, 85% of the people on the planet. This is so incredibly specific and so powerful and weird, to be honest with you, um, that it matches everything and it blows him away. How do you think Daniel is feeling as this is happening? And how do you think Nebuchadnezzar is feeling when this happens? You can choose either one of them. How do you think these two men are feeling as this is going on? Somebody give me Daniel. Somebody give me Nebuchadnezzar. Well, for one, I think Daniel feels good that he saved all those people's lives, excluding his. Yeah. Well, well, not least of which was his, right? You know, his and his buddies, they're, they're going to live. They're going to make it. So that's good news for sure. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Uh, he's got to be relieved. He's got to be relieved. And mm -hmm. even when you know that you know that you know, there's also that still little bitty piece that you're like, man, it's going to yes. feel good when you get I'm it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> good stuff, Donna. What else? Anybody else, another Daniel or anybody else got one for Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar, because um, he had to have seen how powerful God was to be able to, you know, give Daniel insight on that dream and, and possibly, you know, start believing in God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you guys read in your homework, maybe you've already read in preparation for our class tonight. I don't know. But as you read, you'll see how specific it was. It's really powerful when God kind of cuts through the haze and makes it known. This isn't just a lucky shot in the dark. This is me and I'm speaking to you. And I didn't intend to say this, but you know, it's always powerful to me when I'm reading a passage of scripture or even sometimes when I'm preaching hopefully preaching to the congregation, but God kind of nudges everything out of the way and like just touches my heart with something. When it happens, I'm just blown away. It's like, it's just so personal to feel that and realize that God cares enough to like touch my heart personally. Like who am I? I'm nobody. Uh, none of us are deserving of his touch or his, attention and yet he does that and it's crazy and when you feel it it's just this beautiful feeling of being known and um, I think that's a powerful thing and I can't help but think to myself what Nebuchadnezzar I think you're right on Terry what you said to know that God is powerful and sees the insides of our heads and our hearts it's got to blow you away and uh, I think that's a great great insight Terry um, I think speaks to me anyway so thank you good good stuff um any other thoughts observations anything nebuchadnezzar daniel any of that i think uh, daniel feels that he is being used by god because uh, it says that Daniel then confidently tells a vision. He gets that confidence from God. And I think uh, he knew his purpose being in the kingdom of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a great observation as well. You guys are great. Um, I, I think that's true too, that he feels that confidence that he is where God wants him. He's God's man delivering God's message uh, in God's moment. I think that's pretty cool. So that's good stuff. He, I, I should probably preach yeah. that, message, right? God's man, God's message, God's moment. That's pretty good. Uh, good stuff. All right, Eric, what you got, man? He asked for time to go interpret it in front of the king before he even knew what it was. Like he, he said, I'll go in front of the king and interpret your dream for you. And then he asked God to show him what the dream meant. That's right? a great point. Didn't, didn't he? That, that takes guts, man. That, that, that's, that yeah, takes real time. back. Yeah. Confidence. That, it's confidence. Yeah, super confident, no doubt about it. Um, mm -hmm. Great, great point. There was, no, uh, there was no fear in Daniel. He stepped in there confidently, straight into the presence of the king, the guy who said he was going to kill him, and said, I got this for you. Just give me just a little bit of time. But I got this for you. And it seems like to me, I read the scripture. It seems to me it's overnight. Does that make sense? Did, did it feel like that to you? It was like he went in, said, I've got this for you. And then overnight, he got the answer and he delivered. It was just amazing. Good stuff. Good stuff. 
All right. So a couple more verses of scripture here from the book, and then we're going to do the two big takeaways and we're going to shut it down. Here we go from Daniel 2, 46. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell prostrate before Daniel and paid him honor in order that an offering and incense be presented to him. The king said to Daniel, surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery. And so this is part of why I think this was not just simply an exercise and I'm the king, you do it my way. He called it a mystery. I think he was in the dark too. I think he knew it was important. I think he knew that God was speaking to him, but I don't think he knew what he had told him. I think he had forgotten. And I think it was cool the way that God revealed to him in such a way that he was the one who was actually revealing the mystery. And then the king placed Daniel in a high position, lavished many gifts on him, made him ruler over the entire province of Babylon, and placed him in charge of all its wise men. Moreover, at Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego administrators over the province of Babylon, while, while Daniel himself remained at the royal court. So here are a couple of big takeaways for you guys. I would say that no matter what you face, what your skill set is or isn't, God can reveal things to you if you will seek his face and seek his glory. I think sometimes we act like, well, I just can't do that. That's just not me. I just don't do that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying that you go out there and every single time, you know, you're, you've never spoken a minute in public, you know, and now I'm going to be a preacher or a speaker, you know, something like that. I don't necessarily know that that's the case, but God can use you and me in extreme circumstances when he needs us, if we are willing to be willing to be used. I think for most of us, it's very important that we don't close the door on God's ability even when we don't have the total faith in our own. Does that make sense? Um, I think we can accomplish more than we give ourselves credit for because we never take into account what God can do through us if we're available. And so I just encourage you guys, if you're seeking his face and seeking his glory, don't sell yourself short um, because God is with you. And that's important to know. Um, I would also say here, Let's go back and you see it says, Daniel says, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain the king the mysteries that he's asked. He's, he's not saying, I'm your guy. I'm the man. I can do it. Nobody else could do the things that I do. That's not what he's saying. He's, be, he's being very, very clear. He's like, God can do it. He's the one who reveals mysteries. He is the one who's shown King Nebuchadnezzar what is going to happen in the days to come. And I just wanted to say this. I don't know if you guys can kind of understand this. You don't have to go Old Testament prophet on people. Thus saith the Lord our God about you and all the things that you, you know, like, I mean, as cool as I sound doing it, don't try this at home. I'm just saying, okay? <laughs> no, seriously, kidding, kidding, <laughs> totally kidding aside. I would say that is not going to go well, okay? I mean, it's just not. But why not say to somebody, hey, I know you're upset about something. I just want you to know I'm going to be praying. And I'm going to be praying that even though we don't want to talk about it, that the Lord would have your heart ready to hear from him. And that, you know, I'm going to be praying that he'll reveal to me how to be the friend and support to you that I ought to be. You say something like that. And then later, if you say, you know, I get the sense that maybe this is what's going on. Maybe I'm right. Maybe I'm wrong. But I'm telling you, I'm praying in that way. If that's what they're dealing with, how powerful does that be? Now, I don't think you need to be, you know, the person who's like trying to read the tea leaves. I think you need to be in prayer, but you don't have to be the person who says, you know, those serve the Lord God about the oh, Frank Smith. You know, it's not that it's not what you're trying to do there that makes you look powerful, but stay engaged with people and pray for people and just be yourself. And you'd be amazed at how God can work in people's lives through people like us just normal everyday folks, you know? So anyway, that's one of my big takeaways. Um, and I'm going to give you one more big takeaway. This is big takeaway number two. And then I'm going to give you one chance to say something before we go. All right. So here we go. Big takeaway number two, no matter what you've accomplished, 
You are standing on the shoulders of other people to get to where you are. Here's what I mean. Oh, there's my dad in the background. Hey, dad. You should have to listen to me for at least a couple of minutes. I've listened to you like for decades. So at least listen to me for just a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm getting up and out of here. I'm kidding. All right. So here's what I would say. Second big takeaway. You are standing on the shoulders of other people to get to where you are. And I love that Daniel here is not act, acting like I did it. I did it. I did it. He's very clear that God is the one who deserves the credit. But do you notice the number of times that he says, we ask, he made known to us, and then he does not forget that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be honored along with him because they were the ones who were with him in there in prayer. You guys notice that? That's powerful stuff. And if you are a person or if I am a person who acts like we're the only one who deserves the credit, and we're the only one who's doing anything right around here. And yep, you got the right guy to promote and put in charge here in Babylon. You know what? Eventually, people are going to see through you. But when you say, I'm standing on, I'm here in front of you, King, telling you what God has told me, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, we've been praying about it together. He made it known to us. And we are here to tell you it's a different thing. And God is the one who ultimately gets the glory and honor, not one Superman. And that's important, I think, you know, that we grasp that. So um, I am going to give you guys the opportunity to not embarrass me in front of my father. So you guys tell me one thing that uh, you'd like to do as an observation before we give you the final homework and say our final goodbyes. Anybody? Y'all don't leave me hanging in front of my dad. Well, Nebuchadnezzar also gave the glory to God. So that's kind of interesting that he would also give the glory to God. Yeah. And when we're doing it right, the glory goes to God and not to us. I think that's a great point, Janet. It's a great observation. Anybody else? Any other comment or question before I hand off the homework and let you guys go? Anyone? And I think that we should always re remember that too, that there's so many things that we can't do on our own that we just have to ask you know god for that help that extra help that's why we are like always need him to stand on his shoulders or him to carry us yeah you know and we we tend we sometimes we tend to forget that when we accomplish stuff that we didn't do it alone yeah. we didn't get to that point alone without you know without having somebody's there or you know having god to yeah. carry us and when there's that one foot in the sand Mm -hmm. yeah and i think not only is god the one to carry us but sometimes he makes us um have to rely on one another which is yes. a key because i think he not only wants us to be a part of you know the trinity you know he and the holy spirit and and god the father but i think christ wants us to be a part of his body because that's a big deal that's a really important thing because we're not meant to be going through this life alone and so no. sometimes some of the best things that you'll ever do as far as getting close to God are hearing from brothers and sisters in Christ who've been praying for you and there to support you at all times. So that's, that's important, yeah. good stuff. Yeah. So we're all standing on one another's shoulders and leaning on each other as we make it through. And that's important to know. Good stuff. You guys did good. Thank you so much. All right. Well, here is your homework assignment. You guys read Daniel chapter two, verse 29 through 49. It's so about 20 verses there and come and have an insight. Now I'm just going to be honest with you. This is the story of the statue. This is the statue itself and the rock that comes and destroys it and all those different things. So it's not quite as easy to find, but I looked through there already. I see at least two or three things easily that could be insights and things that we can share and take away from that uh, passage of scripture. So Daniel chapter two, 29 through 49. Some of y'all taking pictures so you don't forget. I appreciate that. I'm down with that. All right. So let's have a word of prayer and then I'm going to let you guys go. Y'all do your things and uh, God bless you guys. It's great to see you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, come to the end of uh, this passage and, and this time around your word, I pray that you would help us to lean on one another and always look to you. And I thank you, dear God, that you are always with us and accomplishing more through our lives than we could ever do on our own. 
So God, as we lean into you, lean into one another, I pray that we would continually be searching and seeking for your path for us through this world so that we might be your vessels that accomplish your will and purpose that you've given. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much. Been good around God's word. We'll talk to you guys and we'll see y'all on Sunday. It was great to see some of y'all's faces in person. Maybe see a few more of you guys in the next couple of weeks. God bless you guys. Y'all be safe. Okay. Bye. Bye.